Supernova International Ska Festival is only weeks away now. Do you have tickets to what is going to be the biggest and best U.S. Ska Festival of the year? Look at this lineup. Tokyo Ska Paradise Orchestra, Fishbone, Bad Manners, Voodoo Glow Skulls, Bad Operation, Catbite, Out of Control Army, Rude Girl Review, Stranger Cole, Suicide Machines, and so many more. This is the best of the best. Tickets are $150 for the entire three-day fest or $59.99 per day. If you can't make it but you want to catch the entire show, you can purchase a live stream of the entire festival for $39.99. Aaron and I will be hosting a second feed that is included in the package where we'll be chatting with folks at the festival, interviewing bands, and discussing the performance. Head on over to supernovaska.com to grab tickets. If you're an In Defense of Ska Patreon subscriber, you'll get a discount on the live stream package. And if you're not in the In Defense of Ska Patreon, what are you waiting for? For $5 a month, you'll be supporting your favorite podcast. See you at Supernova International Ska Festival on September 15th, 16th, and 17th. This is the Ska Festival of Ska Festivals. And now, on with the show. Open Mike Eagle is one of the greatest living rappers currently working right now. His influences range from MF Doom to They Might Be Giants. And yes, you can hear these disparate influences in his music. We sat down with Mike to chat about a whole range of topics, including two, but not limited to ska. Be sure to check out his latest record, a tape called Component System with the Auto Reverse, which he released late last year. We recorded this a while ago, but we actually just got to see Mike opening for AJJ. Yeah. It was really cool. One, getting to see his set, which was great. And two, just getting to see him uh, after the show. My favorite thing, though, was that he said to me, I could see you vibing in the back of the room because I'm so tall. Yeah. (laughs) So you could see me over the top of the audience. That is definitely uh, an advantage to uh, your height and also like your look because you got the long hair and everything. Is Is that performers see you? Yeah, it is pretty interesting. And I've always wondered, like, because I know I can see people from the stage. So I'm always like, they have to be able to see me and all all this hair. <laughs> and I'm glad that uh, Open Mike Eagle confirmed. Also glad to hear that you have a good vibe. <laughs> <laughs> well, that I was vibing. Yeah. That I was enjoying the set. Yeah. What if I'd just been looking grumpy? That would have been terrible. Yeah, I bet I bet you have uh, gone to a few shows and looked grumpy and, and probably have given bummed out a few bands if i have ruined your performance (laughs) please email the show and i will apologize i want to start with uh talking about your your tour with uh, ajj i think that was last year Mm -hmm. there's this uh, tiktok video where you're in like a gas station parking lot like doing push-ups yep and then the 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 camera pivots to Sean, and he's just like watching you while eating some chips or something. He, I think he was eating a, a chicken leg that he also <laughs> got at the gas station. I believe that's that's the case. Do, do you normally do push ups in the gas station parking lots while you're on tour, or was this a special occasion? Oh, no, yeah, that's that's my exercise. We're in the car for four to seven hours at a time, and and the rule is at every gas stop, um, 30 push ups every gas stop. Wow. Yeah, it feels like tour if you if you want to like uh, live some semblance of healthy life, you have to make weird rules like that. Yeah, yeah, cuz you're not going to get any exercise other than that. I mean, I guess and also cuz we were with a band loading in was exercise every day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um but yeah, other than that, like usually on a rap tour, you're just driving and drinking when you get there and, you know, not carrying much. So, yeah. I uh Added that little wrinkle in. I forgot where we picked that up because I've been doing that for years. Mm-hmm. But that's that's the rule: thirty push-ups every gas stop. Nice. And you, did anybody else join you on the tour for that? Uh, well, I was traveling with Video Dave. He's my performance partner, and typically throughout the years, he's done the push-ups uh, with me. That particular tour, I think he was dealing with some sort of old man shoulder injury, mm. so he couldn't he couldn't join me. 
should have been doing squats then. You know what? That's a great option. That's a great option. <laughs> we've never we've never done a leg day exercise <laughs> on one of the gas station stops. And you're right. That's what we should do. I mean, just body weight squats don't feel like much at first, but then you get like, you know, 50 in. Yeah, my knees are actually hurting at the mere mention of them. So <laughs> I, I do think I do think you're right. That's that's the way forward. And then for push ups, are these wide grip push ups or are you doing military where their elbows are into the ribs? I don't. Uh, I mean, yeah. I guess wide grip. I don't. I don't know too much about um, push up technique. Okay. Um, I kind of just do them the same way I've been doing them since I was a little kid, which is probably yeah. wrong. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, flat. Try to keep a a, a straight plank. You yep. know. Yeah, as long as your butt's not in the air, you're good. Exactly. That's the yeah. only thing I've ever learned about push up is not to do that. I should I should interject and say that Adam like leads an exercise class. <laughs> I mean I would be down for the 30 push ups at every gas stop. I think I might start doing that. It did feel like we're gonna we were gonna get deep into form. Uh, form critique and i gotta say because there's been people because i've been doing this for so long there are plenty of videos of me doing these push-ups and occasionally somebody makes a comment on a video with like a form critique and i'm like how dare you how dare you like do you know like yeah. every time i do a push-up at a gas station i also feel like i'm putting my life on the line because mm -hmm. there's drivers who aren't you know they're not necessarily looking on the ground to see if there's a person when nope. they get ready to park. So these are very these are very risky push ups. Like the first time you did it, did you feel a little um self conscious about doing that? Like just doing push ups in public? I don't think it was self conscious. I, I don't you know, it it's been so long. It's been so many years that I honestly can't even remember like the mindset when it started but i know very quickly into it you start to get excited for it it's like something to do yeah and and there's this real sort of um endorphin rush you kind of get immediately after too especially um if it's been a really long ride you know like you get back in the van after that your system is activated mm -hmm. yeah I like the video though. The video on uh, the TikTok video was really funny because I think the contrast of Sean's absolute nonchalance and and you're getting a good workout in is just priceless. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought that was hilarious. I mean, because I, obviously I couldn't see it happening at the time because <laughs> I was facing the curb. But um, but yeah, I thought that was hilarious. What was it like touring with AJJ? Super fun. Those guys are all awesome. Um. And they put on a great show and they're like very down to earth for how like successful they are. Like mm -hmm. they, they, they really do keep kind of just punk aesthetic in terms of how they approach things, even though like they're playing some big ass rooms sometimes. And I think that's super cool. I get surprised like, cause I know that they're that big, but sometimes I, I forget that they're that big. Yeah, me too. And I'm like, Oh weird. They're playing some big rooms. Yeah. Yeah, first time I saw AJJ was at the Asian Man Records parking lot show. And they're just playing in the parking lot. Yeah, I don't think anyone was doing push-ups either. Nobody, <laughs> nobody did push-ups. Yeah, push I was, I was conspicuously missing. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> did their audience? Did they like you? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're. You know, it was a little trepidation the first show. Like, will they? But yeah, they they were super into it. Super open. Yeah. super kind audience and like very down for going on musical adventures. Mm -hmm. I assume that the act that you did was similar to the one, cause I saw you at Sacramento, um, you know, a few months back you had a show and it was with, um, video Dave was, was with you. I, I assume your show was kind of like that. Yep. Just like that, but a lot shorter. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I saw you in, um, like 2018. And you were opening for why? Why was the headliner and Rituals mm -hmm. of Mine? I think was the support act. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What what city? Uh, Berkeley. Was that Sacramento? Oh, no, it was, Berkeley. I, I okay. went to Berkeley. Yeah, nice. And um, you were by yourself on stage, mm -hmm. and you had the like a touch eye touch pad. And like I remember, I was already a fan and stuff, and I actually was like, you were the artist I most wanted to see that night. 
and um, but I hadn't seen you live before. And I, I, I liked that there was like this little subtle arc. It was like this little arc in your set where you like kind of were low key. And you had like, you, I think you had like your, your coat or your hoodie over your head. And you slowly sort of like became more animated as the set progressed. I do. I do remember the arc of that set. That yeah. Was, yeah. That was when I used to have an arc. <laughs> <laughs> Can you explain that arc to us a little bit? Um, I, I feel like that was a very accurate description of it. Um, well, I'd say all, like, so the way I saw it in my head was like a curve where it's like, like a roller coaster, almost mm -hmm. slow kind of uptick into like an early sort. There was like an early song I had that was a little more explosive and it kind of went back down again and started another arc up towards like a, a big, um, big voiced animated energetic song at the end. Um, and also what went along with that arc was that I started out those shows. I started out that set very melodic. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, like a lot of the, the sing rap kind of slower BPM stuff. Um, and then as the set went on um, fast, you know, more up-tempo stuff, more rappy stuff was, was near to the end of that set. Because I could tell like, I was like, Oh, Oh, he's he's he has a whole thought process of behind this set order, but it's not, like, like like it's subtle. It's not like you're not beating. If you're not paying attention, you maybe you're not catching it. But if you're paying right. attention, it's got this whole thing happening. And I thought that was so cool. Yeah, it worked really. It worked so well. I completely abandoned it <laughs> <laughs> to this. Day. Well, I think I think when it ended up happening, um, like that set worked really well for opening for an act like why i did a i did a tour with gold panda that year and it, it worked similarly for that um like it works really well for warming people up to me if they don't know who i am and mm -hmm. also a lot of the music that i was making at that time um had the sort of dichotomy between very melodic half song stuff um and rap stuff and i think just as it as as it went on as as my career went on um i started to make music that fit less onto that spectrum easily mm -hmm. so and, and and you know i was headlining more too so i just kind of had to reconstitute it based on having like a bunch of smaller arcs rather than this big sort of swoop that uh that i was doing in those circumstances when you were on that tour with ajj did you have any particularly particularly amazing shows like I'm, I'm curious how like for instance the chicago show was since you're from chicago originally i wish i could tell you that i remember <laughs> that show. um gosh did we even end up doing chicago because that tour ended up stopping oh did and, it yeah we um we had to stop the tour because uh somebody in in ajj got covid oh. uh and we stopped in indiana so i i don't remember if we had done chicago before that or not i feel like maybe we didn't oh what a bummer and you got you got covid is that's why you was, was that why you rescheduled the sacramento and san francisco show right yep yep we ended up getting covid uh during a very extremely treacherous drive from Denver to Salt Lake City, where we almost died twice. That drive is the worst. And then we couldn't go the safe way up through Wyoming because it was snowing and the roads were closed. So we had to go the ass way right through the Rockies. We almost died twice. One time uh, we, were, we were going through the Rockies and we realized under very terrible circumstances that the windshield wiper fluid was not working <laughs> on yeah. the van so the ice started caking up and we couldn't do shit about it and we didn't know until it was like almost completely ice covered dave had to rig um rig he, he ended up i forgot how he did it we stopped at a gas station and we bought some wiper fluid and he bought a big ass bottle and he rigged it so he could squeeze it outside of the passenger window over the entire windshield 
every five to seven minutes so that we could see while we were driving. Yeah. Um, we ended up having to switch the vehicle out midway through the drive just because that was untenable, not having uh, like because it was. Uh, the problem was that the the fluid had frozen inside the car, yeah. so it was no longer working. Um, so we switched the vehicle out. Um, that took a couple hours, and then we got back on our way again. And then we got about an hour outside of Salt Lake City, and these shits called snow squalls started happening where like it like there was the sun was not out anymore and it started snowing but it was like snowing horizontally mm-hmm. <laughs> like like we could like could not like visibility went from 100 percent to zero percent like in seconds um and yeah we almost died then too and then when we got to salt lake city finally um we uh tested positive for covid oh my god yeah yeah that that drive i mean either way you cut it i mean you were saying that's the ass way to go but through wyoming's not much better i mean it's flat but it but that freezes up real bad too i just did that drive back in march and we took the 70 this band the wonder years took the the 80 and they got stranded they because once that snow is over once that freezes over you can't go anywhere Mm. And I, I spun out on, on in 98, I spun out on that stretch of 80. Oh my gosh. Black ice in the middle of the night. The, both those drives are terrible. <laughs> that shit is, that shit really sucks. And I don't understand the, the wiper fluid freezing. Like it shouldn't do that, but it shouldn't do that. <laughs> we experienced that same thing. And it's not even just snow that's on your windshield. It's like road grime from all the salt they put on the road yeah. to try to keep it from freezing. So it's like not even just ice. It's like salt and grime and filth. And then and <laughs> your your friend though getting the, the getting the water bottle to square out the window. That's smart because we just oh gosh, I thought he was a genius. He was a genius. He he, he was a brilliant move. Brilliant <laughs> <Yeah>. move, MacGyver. <laughs> How, so you, so you've opened for a lot of artists or gone on tour with a lot of artists that are you know in different genres and maybe don't sound like you. Is that? Have you have you sought that out, or do do the do they seek you out? Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, and I think what happens is that a lot of the bands in certain circles sort of like recommend me to each other <laughs> as somebody who can do a good job opening. Uh, and and um, I have the sneaking suspicion that a lot of um, rock bands, punk bands, um, singer songwriters, they're just convinced that rappers are cooler than they are so they always <laughs> we need something cool on this tour yeah i think i really feel like that's that's part of the thought process did you ever have a moment in your career where you're you you started to think like it would be great if you were being exposed to a wider audience or would you or were you always kind of on board to play with whoever i mean not necessarily whoever like I, I i do think you know certain things fit a lot better than others um and yeah, I mean, but but I do I do enjoy opening, um, just because it, it it typically does work out well for me. It typically does expose me to more people, and you know, it's a lot less risk. Like it's a, it's another it's it's it reminds me of something they say in stand up comedy, where like the best position to be in on a, a stand up comedy tour is is the middle act. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not responsible for filling the house, uh, and you usually get to perform for a full room same thing with bands yeah yeah okay i'm really ignorant in this area but the touchpad thing you use and you still used it in sacramento has like beats and stuff in it what is that called um well no it's it's a it's a um a novation launch pad and it just it controls ableton okay yeah you have everything like pre-programmed and it just just triggers yeah it's 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 triggering sounds it's triggering effects. And I, I guess that's pretty much it. Um, the way the launch pad works, it's like a eight uh eight by eight grid, I think. And you can each you can set it up where the the interface, like, okay, so you're you're seeing the grid, but you can press a button to changes the grid to like a different page. So like the first page is, you know, me triggering 
beats, the second page is like me triggering effects. And then there's a page setting for it where all of those same buttons become uh, a drum machine, you know, like there's a bunch of different ways to program it with Ableton. And that's what I, uh, that's what I use. That's my weapon of choice. Is it labeled somehow? Or you, do you have to like memorize? Um, I mean, I, I have to, I mean, it helps when I've memorized, but also um, with Ableton, everything is kind of in there anyway. If I need to take a peek at it, I can't, okay. you know, like it's all like in Ableton's very grid based to begin with. So you can kind of look and see what's what if you need to. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I always wondered, and like, I don't know if it's quite the same thing, but I remember watching like videos of Sean Wasabi doing like his music and like like lightning fast, like triggering and, and stuff. And obviously like it must be a memorization thing or I don't know what the trick is, but it's pretty crazy to watch. Yeah. I don't, I don't know who that particular artist is, but, um, I feel like for a lot of people who use those sorts of grids, it's that a lot of the, like they might be in different sessions from song to song, but a lot of the mm -hmm. buttons are doing the same thing inside of each session. If that makes any oh, sense. Oh, I see. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, like this button triggers a sample. This button um, is a drum. This, you know, so like there's a system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you're not having to relearn it for every single song. You're just, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's all, it's all pretty. Um, yeah. You, you kind of set it up how you want to use it in general and you set up, you know, each song session to correlate with, with that system you've set up. All right. So you, you have a song called South side Eagle. I do. Okay. I'm from the nineties fishbone with theremin and big hits was love songs to heroin. Yeah. What's your relationship to fishbones music? Oh God. Um, so I remember like, so I'm a kid of like MTV is 120 minutes. Like mm -hmm. that shit is like a big part of my personality and like college rock and all that shit from that era. And the thing about fishbone is that artists and, and, you know, uh, journalists at that time, whatever, uh, even DJs, it's like they used to talk about Fishbone all the time, but they would never play Fishbone. <laughs> totally. And like I was a kid who was into, you know, They Might Be Giants is still my favorite band of all time. And, uh, and you know, Primus and Ween and, um, you know, and, and bigger bands like Red Hot Chili Peppers and uh, Faith No More. And um, I feel like Fishbone was always at the periphery, at the intersection of all of that stuff. Um, but I would not actually hear their music much. So I knew who they were. And every time I saw them, I'm like, oh, that's dope. But I wasn't, you know, this is before I like even had money. So I couldn't really buy anything. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in college is when I actually started buying a lot of music. And I bought one of their albums, something about a monkey and a brain or something like that give a monkey a brain and he'll swear he's the center of the universe yes <laughs> and i enjoyed this album a lot but it didn't make me like go buy a bunch of more fishbone now when my son was like four or five years old um i don't remember how this happened but we started watching a, a lot of fishbone videos mm -hmm. uh, and he got really into them and i got even more into them and you know, I started to listen to him a little more around that time. And this is maybe like 10 years ago. Um, so now I, I think maybe it was around the time that documentary came out. Every is everyday sunshine. Yeah. Everyday sunshine. Yeah. And, and I really got, uh, into their story then. And then, um, I have bumped into Angelo more a couple times here in, in South LA and, I fawn over him and he always forgets that he met me. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, we had him on the podcast, uh, in 2021 and, um, yeah, I, I went and saw him play a solo. Sh he, he has a solo act and uh, like, this was probably like three months ago. And, and I mentioned that he was on the podcast. He's like, Hmm, I think I remember. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that that Angelo, he lives in the moment. He lives in the moment, yes. absolutely. <laughs> Do you have any favorite uh, Fishbone songs or albums or anything? So, uh, on the album that I have, which is the uh, the Monkey and the Brain in the Universe, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
Unyielding Conditioning is a song that I really, really like. Uh, and um, it's a lightning from the sky will strike you down. I don't think that's the name of the song, but that's like the chorus. Um, yeah. It's, I think it might be called No Fear. Um, so I like that one a lot. And then when I got into them, when me and my son were watching the videos a lot, um, there's a song they have. It's called Modern Industry. Oh yeah, that's a that's I a great song. I really like that song a lot. Um and I feel like there's there's a few more from around the video time too, but the one that comes to mind first is that Modern Industry cuz I still go back to that one a lot. I like that song a lot. Do you know that song? I think it's from the same record. It's called Black Flowers. I don't. It's kind of a metal-y like funk song. I saw like just recently I was watching uh, I found a video of D'Angelo playing um a festival. I'm not sure if it was Afropunk or it was something but he played a cover of that song and I think Angelo was there and Angelo came on and played some horn. Oh shit. It was wow. Like his interpretation of that song was so good. I had to check that out. That sounds that sounds amazing. Yeah, cuz it's kind of like a slow it's kind of like that fishbone like it's rock but it's got a funk like sort of thing so and D'Angelo like made it even like funkier mm-hmm. but you know it it definitely made it his own. It was very good. Yeah, I got to peep that. Yeah. Yeah, Unyielding Conditioning is one of my favorites. And, like, you know, I think one of the best ska songs of, like, the 90s, in my opinion. Wow. So it's, it's okay. That one ranks high. I, I don't I don't really know the landscape. So I thought that might have been, like, a ska deep cut. <laughs> well, it wasn't as... Like, I. That's the song I always felt like should have been a big ska hit in the 90s. Because mm-hmm. it's so good. And it has, like, really great lyrics. And the band's great, you know, like that's like one of those songs where I I have like lamented, you know, in retrospect, like, oh man, that would have been the the song that would really have like made ska this thing that everyone would have like been crazy about if that was the the representation of the song. So, you know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, it's one of the few I know, but I really like that song a lot. (laughs) Have you seen Fishbone Live? I have not. I want to. I never have. I never have had the opportunity to. I've seen Angelo Moore do a, <laughs> the, um at L.A. And this was this used to happen more. I feel like when I first moved here, which damn near twenty years ago. They there there's a lot of uh, like community sort of uh, festivals. Not quite the right word, but um, it's like you know a community event in a park in South LA and there'll be a, a, a small stage and there'll be a lot of uh, local vendors selling, selling a lot of handmade stuff. Um, and that's, you know, that's just historically been something that happens a lot in LA and it's always really dope. Um, and there was one that was mostly attended by um, a bunch of old middle-aged black women. And I saw Angelo Moore get on the mic and he was wearing uh he was wearing okay a pair of pants no shirt and the pants were held up by suspenders mm-hmm. and the pants hung low enough where you could tell he wasn't wearing any underwear <laughs> <laughs> um and i and i don't remember exactly what this poem was about but i think it was very explicitly describing vaginas <laughs> Uh, <laughs> at some point and i just watched him freak out an entire like field of people it was incredible <laughs> oh that's beautiful yeah the reality of my surroundings he has like several poems that come and go and um there's one where he just just goes off about the meter maid fuck the meter maid mm. and i remember as a kid being like why is he angry at the meter maid and then as I got older, I understood. Fuck the meter maid. Yeah. Fuck <laughs> meter maid is a tool of of the, <laughs> the something bad. I don't. Like the, yeah. the tool of the the man. Yeah. Devil. Yes. All right. So you mentioned they might be giants. I know that's like. Uh, yeah, you said like one of your favorite. No, that's that is my absolute favorite band. All right. Let's talk. Uh, I love they they might be giants too. One of my favorite bands. You discovered the band from mtv from birdhouse in your soul yep had to be 89 or 90 so what was your do you remember like what your thought process was when you first 
heard it or saw the video? Yeah, like it was one of those occasions because I used to really watch MTV. Like, like if you could imagine a nine year old who uh, reads a lot, didn't have a lot of friends, wasn't even I wasn't allowed to go outside a lot just because it was a ghetto crack era hell outside of the the building I lived in. So I wasn't I wasn't outside a lot, and I would live with my grandparents. So like every day after school, when I was doing my homework, it was just me and cable TV. Um, that was just what it was. So I used to watch videos like very closely and be very excited. And, and, and I I feel like in a lot of ways I was learning about the world, um, through cable and, um, I would see shows like 120 minutes and I wasn't always able to watch 120 minutes because it was on Sunday nights and, you know, it was school night. I think it came on at like 11. So I could only really watch it. Uh, like if there was no school the next day, it was like one of those Monday holidays. And um, I saw that video. Uh, the the visuals were like crazy to me. Like they were doing like the formation dancing that I would associate with like Janet Jackson videos or some shit where like these people organized into like a, uh, a, a diamond shape. Uh, and then they, these people had like, fake eyes over their real eyes <laughs> um and then you know Linnell is sitting in this chair and he's turning this dial just making this light go on and off and and um flansburg has the weirdest guitar i've ever seen in my life with this like this weird shape that doesn't make any sense and he's like playing these big weird chords and kind of marching through the formation dancing um and what I didn't really understand at the time was like why why this the the music of this song affected me so much, and it all goes back to like this chord progression uh in the hook that is like I had a friend break it down to me once I can't remember what he said, but it's something about it's like this this weird like cycle of fifths marching band sort of um chord progression it's just like this big ostentatious thing that they're also managed to make super fucking weird. Yeah. It just, it just really stuck to me. And it was something like they, they seemed really kind to, and I've always really responded to that um, in music when people um, seem like nice people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, all of that just, just stuck with me. And, and I, I taped, that video I recorded it on VHS and I used to watch it over and over again. And then I ended up hearing it on a college radio station, WXRT in Chicago and was able to tape it off the radio then. So I could walk around listening to it with other music. And then, um, and then I found out that they were the band behind particle man, uh -huh. Istanbul's Constantinople off of tiny tunes. Yeah. I didn't put that together. And then to realize that all three of those songs are from the same album and a buddy of mine at school whose older sibling had all that music. He dubbed me a tape of that album. And that just, he, he, he put flood on one side and Lincoln on the other side. And that was, that was it for me. Yeah. Those are, those are two great albums. I remember I was in high school and I, I think I must have discovered them through Flood as well. And then um, I got Lincoln. For some reason, Lincoln like sat in my ears weird. Like I liked it, but I didn't get it. I think so. there was something similar to me. Well, I, I vastly preferred Flood at that time. And I'm still not sure exactly why. And I love, I love them both to this day. But yeah, yeah. At, at when, I was, when I was first getting into them, vastly preferred Flood to Lincoln. And then, so I, we, uh, my band had a show in like Southern California. So I was like, I'm going to listen to Lincoln the whole time. <laughs> I don't know why it's like, I like wanted to like it, but I didn't understand it. And then I felt like by the end of the trip, I was like, I like it. I guess I had to hear it like five, six times. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the lyrics on Lincoln are way like, like just, a, there's a lot of real shit, real rough, tough, um, heartbreaking lyrics mm -hmm. on Lincoln. Um, I think the thing with flood was, um, 
they met a producer that really understood how to how to get the best out of the sound they were making. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's part of what makes makes Flood so sticky. Flood is like managed as to be um accessible, but like very weird. I mean, like Particle Man, like what a weird song. So strange. Yeah. Probably my favorite song on Flood is Dead, which Dead is incredible. <laughs> That's amazing. But it's I like this piano ballad. The bag of groceries <laughs> accidentally taken off the shelf before the expiration date. Yeah, that shit is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Do you ever cover any uh They Might Be Giants? I have covered yes, I've covered Cowtown, yeah. That's a great I yeah on YouTube he he has a cover of it. It's very weird. Hotel room. Hotel uh, room. And, yeah. and I made it sort of sort of hip hoppy. Many, many references to They Might Be Giants lyrics in uh your songs. Yep. And so let's go through <laughs> some of them. <laughs> Universe Man references Particle Man. Mm-hmm. Yep, and uh, there used to be a version of that one I would do where I would um, play Particle Man and then loop the part that ends up becoming the hook for Universe Man and then go into the song from there. Nice. Um, Sad Face, Penance Raps, closes out with No One in the World Ever Gets What They Want, and that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. A friend that's from uh, Don't Let's Start. Great line, by the way. I mean, goddamn. (laughs) Like, like, that's what I'm like. They, they just write like these fucking wrecking ball lyrics, man. Like they, they really do. Like, and and you can, people can overlook it a lot because there's all, you know, there's also a fucking Doctor Worm, which is yeah, a, a lot less of a wrecking ball. Um, but I, I really feel like they put there's a there's a lot of very very sensitive and vulnerable uh, emotions in a lot of the lyrics that they write. Yeah, like some of the lyrics, like you said, they're like Dr. Worm, or some of them are like super literary. Like Mm -hmm. you can see like English students just like worshiping these lyrics. But then it's like, yeah, like nobody in the world ever gets what they want. Like that's just a, that's just a blunt statement of like what it feels like to be a human. Yeah. That's like, (laughs) that's not like dressed in metaphors or made to be like literary or anything like that. Nope. It's just, that's raw, that's raw pain. Raw pain. (laughs) Let's see, you also got, okay, qualifiers, you reference Weep Day, which is a little bit more obscure, They Might Be Giant song. I love this. I love the obscure ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give me the B-sides. Give me the dialer song joints. I, I, I mean, <laughs> that's just, I honestly, like, they, they just really make a lot of what I consider to be the perfect music. So, yeah, like, there's, there's, in, in any... If you if if any time any they present me with ten songs, I love eight of them. Mm-hmm. We should point out. Let's take a little side little side note and point out that uh, "Boss of Me," the theme song they wrote for Malcolm in the Middle, ska. You know, it's funny. That's one of the few songs they have I don't like that much. <laughs> <laughs> How come you don't like that one? Um. It the 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 music of it seem to me it feels like very safe. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, it feels like it is a is a very safe sort of pop rock chord progression. Um, and it just you know it it doesn't it didn't it didn't it didn't push the buttons that a lot of their music pushes. Yeah, it's definitely not one of their best songs. I agree with you. It's uh, they, there's a million better songs from They Might Be Giants, and and I yeah, and and I totally get yeah. If you you know so if you're gonna make something that's gonna end up being a theme song to a broadcast show, it's probably not gonna be Weep Day. <laughs> I get, it. I get. It. So I want to ask about uh, you. You ended up being a judge on the I Left My Body video contest. Yes, that was controversial. Yeah, so <laughs> I want to hear all about this. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I've I've gotten to meet them, um, and they're very kind to me, and it always makes me want to cry. But um, they asked me if I wanted to be a judge for one of their music video contests where they have, um, there's fans that make music videos for their stuff, and um, one of them basically gets chosen to be, like, the official video. Um, 
And now as I, as I talk this out, I'm like, oh, that's so genius. Like somebody else can take the heat. <laughs> 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 so they, they pick different people to judge. So they picked me to judge for, um, what was the song again? Was it You're on Fire? Oh, God. I left my no, body. No, it's not You're on Fire. I left my body. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think there are rules that say that it has to be like an amateur or non-commercial production as a music video and i think the one that i chose ended up being like it ended up being outtakes or scenes from i think an independent movie that the director just recut as a video i didn't know that (laughs) i was just like (laughs) this is the best video but um when they announced the winner and people found uh looked into it and found out that it was uh that that was how it came together they got real mad (laughs) What was the, do you remember the first time you met them? What that was like? Yeah. Uh, it was backstage at a show they did at the Regent in LA, I believe the first time. Well, that was the first time I met them in a capacity where like I was someone to meet as well. <laughs> uh, Cause I had seen them live uh, three or four times before that. Uh, first time. So then the first time I actually I met Flansburg for the first time in college. I went to one of their shows and it was like, a, you know, this is Carbondale, Illinois at a place I think called Copper Dragon. It couldn't have held more than like 250 people. Um, so it was a kind of gig where afterwards um, Flansburg came out and was signing stuff. Um, he drew this really nice a uh, freehand drawn on the back of a white Puma jacket that I had that I managed to not wash for a couple of years before it became... <laughs> became untenable to continue not to watch it um so that was the first time i met him and it had to be like what 2001 or Mm -hmm. two or something like that um but then when i met him um as an adult and as somebody who had uh some notoriety of his own it had to be 2014 15 something like that so Mm -hmm. uh going back a few years now it at the uh at the Regent and I was allowed backstage and I was just trying to hold my body together, talking <laughs> to my heroes, uh, just trying to play it cool. Just trying to play it cool. Yeah. Do you remember what you said? I think that what happens every time I see them, all like all that I can do is find new ways to tell them I love them. <laughs> you know, I think that's, that's the mission. And I don't know whether or not I accomplished that every time, but, uh, but that's, that's just what happens. It's like, cause I'm, I'm such, I am a, I am such a fan of theirs that like, when, like whenever they drop a new album, it's like Christmas for me. And, mm-hmm. and I get really into the, to the new shit too. Um, so like, I, I, I usually have very specific, compliments about the new project <laughs> hey that's the way to do it mm-hmm. yeah yeah i mean yeah i, I think it, i think it's work i think it works out okay but i i am i probably embarrass myself every time <laughs> <laughs> there's like level like there's certain artists that you can like become friends with and kind of get over that but then there's certain artists that you just can never get over that yeah, no, yeah. I can't. I can't even take it. I can't take it. Like when they're talking to me in my face, like like as a human, I'm like, how is this happening? Like, what is <laughs> what what circumstances of life lead me where I can be in this room having this conversation with these with these two dudes? And then you know, even the rest of the band, like they're all really nice to me. So it's like seven dudes that I'm like, why am why why am I here? Like, what is this? And they're all just like super cool and nice. And we're just, uh, you know, uh, having a drink after the, because we just did this again, like about a month ago, I saw them here in LA and got to hang out with them again. And uh, every time I die a little bit and it's great. (laughs) (laughs) I saw you tweet a little while back about their cover of uh, the Pixies Havelina. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you 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 think you like it? I saw like not some not all your uh, followers liked it, but you're a fan of it. Uh, the their cover of Havelina, I yeah. love it. Yeah, I, I think it might be better than the original. It's different. I, I mean, they're both great. Yeah, 
I just I like how they interpret. I think it, they play like organ as the lead on it or something. Yeah, it's, t- it's, it's some. Yeah, yeah it's a yeah. very different vibe to it. Yeah, and I like that. I think it's Linnell singing his voice he does on it. It's so weird and cool. Like, yeah, I, I really like that song a lot. You're a big fan of P- Pixies too, right? Yep. I saw you did the sixty song, sixty songs about nineties on the Breeders. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Um, what's your favorite uh, Pixies? Ooh, uh, favorite Pixie song. Ah, gosh. <laughs> um, cause I, 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 it's like, I like it all. Um, I mean, I haven't heard a lot of their, the newer stuff. Yeah. Don't worry about the newer stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's, that's really hard for me because I'm also like, this is the thing with me. My first entry into all of that was Frank Black's solo stuff. Yeah. I, I like Frank Black's solo stuff or some of it anyways. He's got hit and miss as a solo artist. Teenager of the Year, I heard that before I heard anything else from that entire outfit. Uh, like, Headache was, like, one of my favorite songs of all time. So, I really got into Frank Black, and I really got into Breeders before I even knew about the Pixies. Mm-hmm. Um, so, then I end up getting into Pixies after that, and I have followed Frank Black's career through, you know, Frank Black and the Catholics. Um you know, like even that weird fucking like country record he did. I like that <laughs> shit too. Like I really like Frank Black a lot. And so like it's almost weird that I haven't really tried the new Pixie stuff because um I don't know. There's just I mean, I, I know I know that there's beef and it's a weird lineup or whatever, but um I don't know. I, I feel like I deserve to give that that shit deserves a deserves a, a chance, yeah. Deserves a chance, yeah. Um, can't say that I, I, I cannot tell you what my favorite, cause I, I, okay. So gouge away. Is that on bossa Nova? Gouge away is on, is that bossa Nova or Doolittle? I can't remember. It might be Doolittle. I, I get them all mixed up cause I just like them all and I play them all. Uh, um, yeah. Crackety Jones. Yeah. Is that on, I don't, whichever album, like, like. Uh, and it might be Doolittle, it might be Bossa Nova. It could be both of them. Gouge away's on Doolittle. Okay. Yeah. So my, Doolittle might be my favorite. Um, but I also really like Trompe Le Monde. Mm-hmm. Trompe Le Monde's a weird one, but yeah. Because it's, it's, a, it's a Frank Black solo album. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's one of those. And that's the thing is I don't mind that because I really like Frank Black. Man, they really went hard playing. Uh, Headache got so much play on 120 Minutes. Yep. I feel like every single time. And you know who directed that video? Who? John Flansburg. <laughs> it all comes back around. <laughs> it all comes back around. Did you ever used to videotape uh, 120 minutes? Yes, uh, as much as I could, because I typically fall asleep during it. And um, yeah. and it wasn't often that I had a two-hour tape either. Yeah. I wasn't allowed to stay up that late, so I would I would program the VCR. Oh, see, I didn't I, I should have done that. I didn't I didn't get into VCR programming. Do you have is is that is it controversial to ask you if you have a favorite uh uh they might be giant songs? Uh it's not controversial, it's just gonna be a long ass <laughs> list. I mean I don't know what <laughs> we have here. Like how many do we want? Do you have a top five? Do you have a top, top five? five. Yeah. Uh okay, so Birdhouse is one. Mm-hmm. Uh, um Okay, I'm just gonna give you a sh- just a just a short list. I'm not gonna put them in any order of okay. just songs of theirs that I love. Um, they have a song called "Definition of Good" that's incredible. Um, uh, "Where Your Eyes Don't Go" mm. it's a fucking amazing song. Um, "Stalk of Wheat" just popped into my head. Deep album cut, I think, from the spine or the else. I forget which one incredible um let's see oh turn around off of uh is it is it apollo 18 i think is what they, uh turn around is one of my favorites a, a, a same album um which describes how you're feeling oh, and man. i can i'm gonna stop because i could just keep going yeah that's the thing <laughs> i could just keep going like I, man so many and every album new favorite songs they're really my favorite okay <laughs> <laughs> i want to switch to adventure time okay you uh you were on a uh, one or two episodes i can't remember i was on one episode i did two different voices on that episode though 
And you're a big fan of the show as well? Mm-hmm. Huge. What is it about the show that uh, you like? Heart. Mm-hmm. I love its heart. I love that it's it's unabashed. Like I feel like when that show came out was kind of the height of modern hipsterism. And one of the calling cards for hipsterism in my eyes was that, you know, society leaned into like apathy real hard. Yeah. And irony. And I'm just not a fan of that shit. Like I'm not a fan of being too cool for the room. Not a fan of like, you know, people were fucking smoking crack and drinking PBR ironically. Um, on some fucking weird nihilist uh shit that I was never down with. Like I I I'm I'm down with caring about things. Mm-hmm. And Adventure Time is a show that has always been like very upfront about giving a shit about its characters, its characters giving a shit about each other, um, and really exploring the layers of humanity, even though all these characters weren't human, but just like they did a great job of introducing characters as villains and then through the shows caring about them you start to peel back these layers and see these tragedies behind almost every villain on the show and it's just you know it's just that that level of depth and humanity um always really made that show resonate with me you were the gingerbread man in the son of a rap bear episode and, and you did a, like a, a bat rap battle. Yep. What was that experience like? Uh, especially I'm curious on your take on like what you think of the music. Cause the music often, it doesn't have a, like a steady rhythm and how, how you kind of work through with that and, and with them on that song. I ended up doing a lot of work on that episode with them even before I was officially casted in it because I have I had a relationship with the showrunner at that time, Adam uh, Muto. And um, he, he knew I was a big fan of the show and he knew me as a rapper and um, he's a fan of mine to some degree. And he knew how important it was that they get rap right um, to the best of their ability given that a lot of the show is written by people who don't rap uh, Mm -hmm. and and didn't understand the nuance of it. So um, I worked with them to kind of smooth out to the best of my ability, a lot of what they were attempting to do with rap and and kind of making it work. Cause you're right. Like there wasn't a lot of backing tracks. It wasn't a lot of um, rhythm and, you know, a lot of the way these the, the raps were originally written, you could tell what they were uh, trying to say, but they didn't know a lot about like word economy. They didn't know a lot about meter in, in, in the sense of having to make sure that there's a balance between the amount of syllables in the first line and the second line for like rap to like really make sense. Um, so I helped out a lot with that stuff. Um, and I think, you know, th- just with the nature of animation and how they had to be at the storyboard uh, phase before they even brought somebody like myself in to, to look at things meant that like there wasn't a ton that could be changed. Um, but I think we did a, a pretty decent job of getting it, um, getting it to where the characters were, were doing what they were intending to do. And it was also working in the time that they had to have each, um, each sort of verse sit in in the um in the runtime of that episode so yeah i mean it it was it was certainly a challenge but i loved it i loved it they cared enough to have somebody in to help them out on that stuff and 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 try to get it right were you were you involved directly with building the beat or more more as an advisory position yeah i mean yeah i had nothing to do with the beats at all okay oh yeah the beats uh were already you know kind of set in stone by the time I, I was involved in the process in any way. Okay. But then just a matter of carving, carving out how the, how the lyrics were going to fit. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, cause if I remember correctly, all the lyrics were written before there even was a beat too. So there uh-huh. was that whole thing of trying to fit, uh, fit what they wanted to do in the, in the confines of 
the beats that were were available. So at the Sacramento show, I saw you. Um, you you played your song for Doom, a tribute mm-hmm. to MF Doom, and then um, after that, which I thought was probably the best part of the show. Oh, said, when I did somebody else's song. <laughs> well, it's the emotional. Damn, Aaron. Because you said this one's for me. Yeah, and true. then you played it, and you came in the audience, and you. Yeah, you, you you did the song, but you also were like enjoying the song. You you yes. were like kind of. It seemed like you weren't performer anymore. You were just kind of. You were you were amongst us. Mm-hmm. But did that originally start as a, a freestyle, or did you? You didn't. Did you write that out? Yeah, I, I wrote that a couple of days after you passed away. Yeah, that song. That's that's a really like great like emotional and touching tribute. Thank you. Yeah, it was hard to do. It was like one of those things where it's like, how do I process the grief of, you know, losing who I considered? Like, he's, I mean, my favorite rapper of all time. Like, yeah, it, it just was such a weird emotional space. And it in trying to figure out how to process it, I just got to this space where I was like, I have to rap about this. Yeah. And that's what led me to write that. The, the the ending where you're talking about how you're realizing this photo of him isn't even him in the photo. Mm-hmm. I just I just feel like that is just such a <laughs> it's so perfect perfect way to comment on the enigma that is MF Doom. Absolutely, absolutely, and yeah, that was the wild part about it was like I really it was as I was writing that. It was as you were writing it that you Yeah. That I looked at I looked at it and I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Cause I yeah, I've had I've had this because a a buddy of mine is a um he's been a photographer in the LA Underground the entire time I've been here. And um I bought that piece from him later because he does this thing where he like he somehow um applies his photos to like these like chunks of like thick um, I don't know if it's plastic, whatever, but they they were like these slabs. He ends up putting these photos on these slabs. And so I ended up seeing him at some point and bought this this piece from him. Uh and then I, I realized while I was writing that and I was looking at it, like, wait a minute, not only is that not him, I was at the show where my buddy took that photo of him too. I was at the show where it wasn't Doom actually on stage. But yeah, all that occurred to me while I was <laughs> processing the grief <laughs> of uh, of him having passed away. Do we know? Do we know who's in the photo? Yeah, they exposed that um, shortly. I mean, this is shortly after those things were happening, where he wasn't showing up. It was this DJ guy from Atlanta. I can't remember his name, but that was who he was sending around to do shows for him at that time. Wow, you worked with Doom on a song, uh, "Police Myself." Mm-hmm. What was that experience like? Uh, gosh. I mean, it was all in the course of making the New Negroes television mm-hmm. show. Yeah. And a lot of that is such um, a extreme mashup of super highs and super lows that it's it's sometimes hard for me to parse out one moment from another, how that all went. I mean. I remember I was backstage at a show that I was doing in London when we got the email back where he had laid his verse on the song. And, you know, and I was just backstage in the green room listening to it over and over and over and over again. I was through the fucking moon that we were at. We had actually um, made it happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great feeling getting, getting back up you know a track with a collaboration on it like that Mm -hmm. and then just (laughs) just playing it over and over again in your headphones you can't believe it yeah it was fucking incredible yeah you had a lot of different kind of iconic people on on the uh new negroes show you had lizzo on there yeah it's huge yeah right before she became the biggest (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> biggest star in the world i think we put out that that song in april and in like i think june was when you know she had made that next leap to being the lizzo that everybody knows yeah police myself though i really think that's such a great song thank you 
Yeah, just it's it's definitely high on my list of uh, open mic Eagles songs. Even though you made it for the show, it's just like really great song. Thank you. Yeah, we really tried to make some kick ass music for that show. We didn't want to, you know, we didn't want to bullshit, man. We wanted to like really make music that fucking stand on its own, you know. Mm-hmm. That was my favorite part of the show was the the closing video segment because mm-hmm. it was, you know, it's not. It's not how a comedy show normally ends. Like, here's a video of a song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was that was a, a, a challenge in the production of the show as well. Mm-hmm. But that's you know, a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> I read an interview you did in American Songwriter. This is about, uh, I think, starting hip hop in Chicago. And uh, I want to just uh, see what you think about said finding hip hop finding the hip hop community in Chicago uh and how it was a meritocracy and based on being dope at rapping, break dancing and graffiti. It really gave me a lot of building blocks to build my social self. Oh, and I think before that you said that it you didn't have a lot of social identity before then and it gave you hip hop gave you a sense of self. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious about that. So I know your career really begins when you moved to Southern California, but discovering and be kind of being part of that community really gave you something more than just a career or, or, you know, music that you love. It gave you kind of a way to learn about yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Socially. Yeah. I largely didn't exist. I I didn't know. I didn't have a, yeah, self. I didn't, I didn't have a defined sense of who I was um, before encountering those arts and you know being in an environment where you can earn social capital by getting good at a thing like that um it just really changed um well it started to give me an idea of who i was and what i could do and and who i could be you know you and hannibal burris were friends pretty early right you you were his uh Weren't you like his advisor in college or something? Yep, it was his RA. RA, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, there's a story, right, where the two of you were battle rapping, and um, he ended up winning because he weaponized the uh, your position as an RA. As an RA, he did a very good job of making people laugh at me because I was an RA. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of your early career, it seems like you you have a connection to stand up comedians. Um, obviously Hannibal was on, uh, most of your early records. Do you feel like a kinship towards comedians? Um, I mean, I, I feel what is, it's probably more of an admiration for what they do. Um, and I certainly see parallels in, you know, solitary guy on stage saying stuff and expecting everybody to shut up. Um, <laughs> I, I certainly feel that sort of kinship, but, um, yeah, and and I think the other thing that I feel like I have in common with stand-ups is that a lot of my ideas are generation generated in observation. Mhm. Yeah. And uh so in a sense like I I understand where stand-up material comes from. Um in the sense that a lot of that is the same material that I use to make music. You definitely have a lot of lyrics that are yeah, similar to stand up com- comics in that it's like you're finding the humor in something, but you're also finding the um, the truth and the pain in it in the same time, mm-hmm. which is like some of my favorite, like some of my favorite songs of yours or lyrics have that element to it where it's like funny, but also painful at the same time. And I and I, I just think that's great. Um, I mean, like I know dark, dark comedy, I think that you were really you really leaned into that. There's stuff on your newer records like that, but I think it's a little less like that, a little less on the comedy side. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely less. Um, you know, I think when I when when I made the music for New Negroes, it had to be so comedy forward. And then the sort of lasting emotional impact of how all of that ha- all, everything went down with that show. It, it's like I, I wanted to it made me want to do that less. It it made me want to like lean into different parts of my creativity and making music. I felt a little comedied out. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And it's and, and in a sense, I feel like shit is less funny these days too. So I think that's <laughs> yeah. also got something to do with it. Yeah. No, it does definitely feel like the last two records you did are a shift. I mean, I guess that that works in the timing you're saying. It also works into the timing of we had a pandemic. You went through a lot of your own personal struggles and trauma, and uh, those the the the, mo- the most recent two records. I kind of feel like it's you know you can recognize the the old your older stuff, the career, the tra- trajectory, but it kind of feels like a little different path now. Sure, yeah, yeah, but I, I dig it. I especially um, uh, anime trauma and divorce is probably my favorite record of yours. That's raw shit, man. It's it's raw good. pain. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. what's the one uh, oh yeah what the fuck is self-care that song cr- like both cracks me up and like i just I, I i i there's so many layers to that song like this the the, the idea of self-care being this like industry is kind of i feel like touches on that but also just like what it means to what self-care actually means for you in the midst of trauma and stuff. I don't know that song. I just, I could listen to that song so many times. <laughs> I, yeah. I, that song, that song comes up with people a lot. I feel like that's one of the ones, like I see people like making little videos for and shit, like all the time. I, I really, you know, um, I was questioning it from this very specific space of the self-care that I, that I see advocated for or advertised a lot seems like it's for a very specific class of person Mm -hmm. yeah with a very specific access to resources and shit that i don't have like shit's not in my neighborhood and so i was questioning it from from that place but i think um there's a deeper resonance with people just questioning the idea of self-care uh overall yeah head ass (laughs) (laughs) great um i want to ask about the video because you and video dave are in the video Mm -hmm. and you have um some headgear yeah we got asses on our head (laughs) yeah uh did you guys make it yourself or did you uh oh no so the same um props person uh art department person that made the stereo head for a component system with the auto reverse the, the cover for that uh, made the the ass the, the head asses, uh, and it's in reference to this in living color sketch. Um, I think it's called like the Buttmans or something like that. There was a sketch with these with, where everybody had the butts on their heads, so we had her make uh, replicas of that. And she also works on the incredible Netflix television show. I think you should leave. She also works on that. Ah. she's awesome. Shout out to Elaine Carey. Coffin flop. <laughs> Call, yes. Yes, coffin <laughs> flop. Indeed. I didn't do fucking shit. <laughs> Real quick, what's what's your favorite sketch from that show? Oh God, do I have a favorite? Okay, um, calico cut pants is something I go back to <laughs> a lot. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> like, oh my God. Um, I mean, I I mean, the one that probably makes me most uncomfortable is when they're with. They're they're having dinner with the college professor and he starts eating the guy's burger. <laughs> <laughs> like that shit makes me so deeply uncomfortable and I cannot figure out why. Um, yeah. But I, I like I, I think I like every sketch. I think I like all of them. I, it's just it's an amazing program. My favorite one is is uh, tables when she's oh. driving around talking about how the tables <laughs> is that with the with the uh like it's like a dmv class or something like a, yeah a, yeah yeah not dmv uh and he's like we're not going to talk about the tables yeah, yeah like what <laughs> does she do for me? <laughs> oh my god somebody actually ruined it for me though the the tables she she rents them to like uh she rents them to like uh like comic conventions like where they have all the like people sign like where you get your autographs that's what she's supposed to be doing well, I mean, is it does it ruin because of that? <laughs> I don't know. Like, it's so much weirder when it's just abstract and she's just like screaming about Eddie Munster, like put, putting footprints on her tables. But that's one of the things I like about that show is when at the end of a sketch, like they give you the reason that it's so weird. Like, there's that one, um, sure, with the copy machine and and the the 
the lady employee makes some sort of pun about it and she's mad that nobody's laughing or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> but then at the end, it's like revealed that I, I forget they made it make sense somehow because um, ah, I can't remember how they made it make sense. But that's what I it made me like it even more that they gave it a, a, a reason why she was going batshit about nobody laughing. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I really fucked with that. The the one that the one that I feel like just is the one that everybody comes back to is the Dan flashes. Oh yes, God. yeah. I, 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 <laughs> shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so oh, good. Like that t- that dynamic between him and that other employee is so fucking funny <laughs> to me. And I, I just like all those little workplace ones. Like you can't, like you can't. You can't push back lunch. <laughs> like, <all laughs> He's got shit. the hot dog up his sleeve. Yes. And the one where like the guy was surfing on the conference room table and he fucking <laughs> turns the whole thing over. <laughs> oh, the workplace. And then Calico oh. Cut Pants is like the perfect workplace one. You know? Yeah. Every, every time I turn on Netflix, I have to stop myself from just watching that whole series again. And, and it's really funny to bring this all back around. Yeah. The tour with AJJ. Yeah. All of us constantly quoted that show <laughs> every fucking day. Oh, every day. Amazing. Love that. Who do you like better of, of the two guys in AJJ? <laughs> there's, so I know AJJ is five guys, so there's no way I could choose. Okay, Sean or Ben. Who do you like better? <laughs> I like them both equally. I like I like I like Ben better. <laughs> <laughs> Only because Ben Ben's tall like me, and and I like hugging t- other tall people. Ben is Ben is very tall. It's true. Yeah. yeah. I have to ask one more head ass question. Peter Dinklage, the Peter Dinklage line. You say um, he'll never hear this. <laughs> is that true? Has he never oh, heard it? No, he's he's not heard it. It, it, it. To my knowledge, he hasn't heard. Okay. it. Okay. I feel like he must have heard it. Someone must have said it to him. Uh, I don't know. Like, there, there's a 50 50 chance with anybody that I reference may or may not hear their name. Are uh, there any references that have come back and people have been like, hey, you said that thing about me? Uh, Mark Marin. Um, I said I had mentioned him on a song. That's it, it was roundabout how I ended up getting on his podcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Joe Rogan heard that I mentioned him in a song. Um, John Lovitz heard that I named a song after him. And, we're, and everybody was happy about it. <laughs> Nobody was unhappy that I'm aware of. <laughs> good, good. But I, you know, I, I definitely try to make it a point not to shit on anybody I actually respect in any sort of way. So, so I want to go back a little bit. You, uh, you did the show, um, Mike, the Mike Eagle show, like a live mm-hmm. show, back in the 2010s. Yes, indeed. And uh, there's a video segment. What's the best sandwich? What's the best sandwich? <laughs> oh, I got to bring that back, man. <laughs> Is it, was that a one-time thing or did you do that? That was the only time I ever did <sighs> that one. See, when I, I only did that, it was a variety show, kind of like talk show with music that I was doing. And I only did it five or six times. But my plan was... I was going to come up with a premise that good every time, <laughs> but none of them ever were as good as that one. Like that was the first one and the best. One. So the, the guests you had, like they got, they were aware of the premise and they had to write an actual verse on yeah, a sandwich. I, I told them all the premise at the beginning of the show. <laughs> so they had to write a verse throughout the show and be ready to present it by the end. Because you see them, they're you know they have their iPad or whatever, and they're mm-hmm. they're reading their pre written verse about the best sandwich, and is uh, I think that part actually makes it slightly funnier. Oh, it's, it's great! Yeah, <laughs> that it's is not just great. a freelance about sandwich; it is a thought out verse about thought sandwich. out. You had to you had to be ready to impress. You had to have setups and punchlines about your favorite sandwich. We need convincing. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Um. I don't know what else to say about best sandwich. Just, uh, I think, you know, that was the peak internet. Maybe for me, it was, <laughs> it's all been downhill for, for me. It was for sure. Like with the, for me, without a doubt, that was my finest moment. I did it. I can die happy. So on, uh, your new record, um, component systems with auto reverse, 
you have the song a peak lockdown ramp so that was the first song you wrote for this record it was um can you talk about that because i feel like that song really that really captures the headspace i think Man, we all it felt was 20, it was deep in 2020 it was deep into quarantine yeah. um and i had to like force myself to write a song and it'd been months since i've written anything um and that beat felt as dark as i was feeling and i just fucking started writing you know and it's it's it and and that's the only recording of the song as well like one take never redid any part of it mm-hmm. and and that's mm-hmm. that's the song like i felt like it captured the energy the emotions i was feeling thoughts all of it just right there what was the weirdest thing for you with that that time period like i mean i definitely had a lot but i want to hear yours um oh gosh uh i mean I, you know, my whole life was weird because i you know i i um so i got divorced the year before that i i moved out of my apartment i mean i moved out of my house into an apartment march 1st i went mm. on tour march 3rd for no i'm sorry maybe i think it was february yeah uh i moved into that apartment february 1st and then went on tour like two days after that and i was gone for like two weeks and it was supposed to the tour was supposed to pick back up in two or three weeks and that's when the world shut down so like i just moved into that place like it it was barely furnished and suddenly i couldn't go anywhere yeah yeah, so like my whole life was just a fucking huge mind fuck at that time. It was all strange. What did you do as far as groceries? Oh, um, I would I would go, um, I would go a lot because there was so much shit that was out of stock all the time, and yeah. um, you know, try to get whatever toilet paper was available. I had a lot of bad toilet paper around that time. <laughs> um, uh. Yeah, and then uh, you know, then I discovered Instacart, and then I I started a very bad habit from there. <laughs> I still order all my groceries. I just stopped like <laughs> this year. Like, I, really, I, I I took it because I also had you know I'd gained a bunch of weight over the pandemic too, mm-hmm. and so part of my uh part of my weight loss strategy was just to walk more anyway. So now, like, I just walk to the grocery store every time. Okay. Um, and that was the only thing that stopped me from fucking constantly instacarting shit. Yeah. What were, what were you, what were you eating that was making you gain weight? Well, I was, I was drinking okay. a fucking yep. half a bottle of whiskey every night, pretty much like, like me and Dave, uh, ended up kind of quarantining together cause we were, we were on tour and again, we were supposed to leave again, uh, in a few weeks and, you know, slowly things started getting canceled. He was just kind of stuck out here with me and we're big whiskey drinkers. So, uh, we were putting down a bottle every couple of days, basically just me and him. Yeah. So that, and then, you know, I didn't know how to cook shit then either. So I'm eating a bunch of carry out. Like it was just, you know, the, the food and drink situation in general was, you know, I, I gained quite a few LBs during that time. (laughs) We all did. Yeah. Dave, he uh, he did a lot of crocheting during the lockdown. Mm-hmm. Yep, yeah. he started a few months after that. He started doing a lot of sewing. Yeah, because because uh, video so video Dave opened for open mic, uh, and uh, that was like I think it was the end of the set. He, he showed off footage of all these different weird things that he had been making during <laughs> the lockdown, which is all like really amazing. And then like you know a hat, I think a couple hats too, which he auctioned off. And uh, nice. I definitely, I definitely bought two tickets for the hats, and I got nothing. Oh, oh! <laughs> I'm so sorry to hear that. Oh, it's okay. You never win anything, Aaron. I never win anything. <laughs> there's a song like so, Crenshaw and Homeland. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's just a, a throwaway line on there that I just love. It's uh, you say, "I don't believe in nothing too strongly." Mm. And I just, I really, I really vibe with this line because I feel like everyone is so opinionated about everything, especially online, that I end up feeling this way. Like, I don't really have a strong opinion 
all you people out there who are constantly screaming about your opinion <laughs> on absolutely everything. Like, how do you have such strong opinion about every? I don't know if that's what you meant, but that's how I take the line. It, it, it's kind. It is. It is. It is kind. I mean, I just. I am. I am a person who. Who I have a. Uh, I have a pretty. I have opinions about what it even means to believe in shit. Like, mm-hmm. and and I feel like at the end of the day. Like most people, I feel like if, if, if they believe something, it's because somebody has talked them into it. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's, it's usually if, if you dig down deep into it, it's to someone else's benefit for you to believe anything. Yeah. Um, and so like, I just take issue with conviction on that level. Cause it seems to always be uh due to some sort of manipulation rather than anything that's actually beneficial to a person. Um, so that's that's where that line came from for me. But yeah, so I think it presents a, a similar sort of thought to what you're describing, though, when when I'm seeing people uh, fly off the handle about shit online every day because they're being gaslit six or seven different ways. Um, yeah, I find myself unable to relate. Yeah. And, and most people, it feels like or a lot of people don't like have deep thoughts about their feelings, their convictions. Kind of agreeing with what you're saying. It's like they have these strong opinions supposedly that they have to share, but they haven't really spent much time thinking about the things that they're uh, espousing or the opinions that they hold supposedly so dearly. Mm-hmm. And they don't necessarily know why they think these things so strongly. And yeah. you know, I, I me too. I kind of I kind of sit and think and you know, ponder things and I, you know. I often feel like I don't necessarily want to have a strong feeling or opinion about everything. I want to like think about things and consider things. I don't know. Same here. I mean, that seems to, to me, that seems to get you more towards something that's actually helpful for yourself, you know, actually practical and realistic and, and beneficial in some way, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, versus the belief which, which to me more often than not seems like it, it benefits some other party. Yeah. Having a line, like you say, like, I don't believe in nothing too strongly. That doesn't really like gel well with our current state of things. (laughs) True. People, people with strong opinions, bad ones get a lot of attention. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, yeah, I, I, I I won't say I struggle with that, but I understand that to be the case as well. And, you know, I, I, you know, like I Twitch stream and shit like that. It's like, yeah, I could probably do a re- get a really big audience if i was fiery about some shit you know but i'm mm-hmm. kind of not you know yeah i'm kind of just learning and, and thinking about shit and trying to figure shit out which is a, which is a much slower burn sure uh, considering what people are uh how people are building audiences these days so okay you did a pitchfork video years ago and you you ranked punching nazis as underrated oh yeah <laughs> Very underrated. Hit them with hammers. <laughs> <laughs> Get them. Have you ever have you ever had an encounter a punching Nazi encounter? No, Nazis know better. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like yeah, if you're if yeah, I mean if you're if you're coming to my show, you're coming to start some shit, and and I don't think that wouldn't be a smart move, you know. No, stay away from open mic eagles shows. Nazis. Yeah. Stay away from shows in general. Right. <laughs> yeah. Stay home. Yeah. Stay away from uh, Nazi literature. <laughs> <as well. laughs> Don't go anywhere. If you want to hear the rest of this conversation, head over to our Patreon. Thank you for listening to In Defense of Scott. Please rate and review this podcast and tell a friend. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at In Defense of Ska. Pick up Aaron's book, In Defense of Ska, at your local bookstore or online. This podcast is edited by Chris Reeves of Ska Punk International. This is your co-host, Adam Davis of Omnigong, leaving you by saying Ska now more than ever. Did you have fun at the show when we saw Open Mike Eagle? Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Did you buy any merch? 
I bought an Open Mike Eagle shirt. Mm. How about I yourself? Bought, I bought two records. I bought Brick Body Kids Still Daydream and Component System with the Auto Reverse. I asked Mike at the show, I was like, which records should I buy? I want to get two. And he said, well, this is the best one. and Or this is the new one. And this is the one people like the most. Mm -hmm. I was like, cool. Oh. Give me those two. I feel like it's really important if you get put on the guest list for a show to buy merch. Yeah. Let that be a word to you. If you get put on the guest list for a show, listener, make sure you buy something from the merch table. And if you have $5 left over, which hopefully you do, <laughs> you can use that to uh, get yourself the In Defense of Scott Patreon. Hell yeah. 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 For and only $5, we have so much more, so much more that you can listen to, including an extension of this episode. Yeah. We talked about um, a scientific experiment that Open Mike Eagle was part of. His brain was studied by scientists. Oof. Yeah. So if you want to hear about this study... And lots of other fun stuff. Go head over to the Patreon, sign up. Aaron, who do we have next week? Oh, next week we have a man by the name of Steve Douglas, who is in a band called, well, he is in a band called The Resignators, but he was also once in a band called uh, something, I think, Guar. Hmm. I think I might have heard of that band. Yeah. All right. Well, see you next week. Check it out.